taking a quick live look again at Montreal, which remains in Canada the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. And we were reporting this morning concerns out of Quebec about lack of space already, very full hospitals. What will happen if there is another surge? Will they be able to find space for them? Intensive care units, of course, ventilators. All of this remains a focal point as it has been throughout the pandemic challenge. Think back to March for just a moment. If you're a regular viewer of our program, you'll remember a story we brought you then and the launch of something called the Code Life Ventilator Challenge. Looking to find designs, and here's the criteria for what would be a simple, low cost, easy to manufacture, easy to maintain ventilator that could de be deployed anywhere. That was the challenge behind this particular competition. And back in March, you met Dr. Reza Farivar, the main organizer, who's back with me this morning, the chair, the Canadian Research Chair in Integrative Neuroscience at McGill, back with us this morning because the competition has come to an end and we get to reveal three of the finalist prototypes. Dr. Farivar, nice to have you on the program again. Thank you for returning. Good morning and thank you for having me. We're going to get to those top three in just a second, but I'm just curious, based on response and submissions, how did the challenge go overall? Uh, it was, in a, I would say, a resounding and surprising success, uh, really inspiring, I have to admit. Um, by the time we closed, we received uh, over 1,000 teams registered, 2,600 participants over 94 countries. Uh, so it had a, it connected with a lot of people and it brought a lot of uh, team members together and, uh, and experts together. In addition to the participants, we had an outpouring of support from sponsors who contributed funds to uh, enhance the prizes, to provide funding for prototyping, for uh, paying for services. And we also had uh, uh, an enormous amount of support from experts who donated their time for mentoring the teams for judging and providing feedback and testing. It was just, it's been an incredibly inspiring experience. I'm very, very grateful for everyone. Isn't that incredible? I mean, the judging must have been very challenging given the number of our participants, 94 countries and a thousand different teams and all of it in the end coming down to these three finalist prototypes. Let's go through them together. Uh, Dr. Farivar, can you tell me about the three? Absolutely. So the three, uh, we have them listed on our website as well for, for more detailed information. Yes. Uh, there are three very different designs. Uh, the Halfley team has designed a bellow-based system uh, that is very simple and easy to operate. In fact, I would say all three are quite simple and easy to operate, which is which was an important criteria yeah, that was for a big our challenges. So you know. a bellow-based, like bellows, like in terms of what we use in the fireplace. Is that that's kind of the thinking behind this one? Uh, exactly, exactly. You can you can uh, hmm. conceive of it as that. Okay. Uh, and it's a sort of a classic design. Um, and uh, another one is using a turbine or a blower, um, which is another method that uh, kind of similar to what you have in your CPAP machines for now, sleep Which one machines. is that? Is that the Brazilian one or the other Canadian no, one? No, this is the lung carburetor. Okay, lung that's carburetor. Right. So that's the, the, that's the yeah. Canadian one from Montreal and Havre Saint-Pierre in, in Canada. So the lung carburetor. Right. We're looking at it now. So tell us a little bit about how that okay, works. Great. So this one uses a turbine, so effectively a blower that produces the air pressure, and then their their circuitry controls that very carefully to put in the, the right amounts of pressure and volume into the patient and then uh, receive it afterwards and then keep measuring that. And also they have the, the capacity for mixing it with oxygen and humidity. Um, and, and it's a very compact system, so it makes it very easy to... Um, uh, place it in this in a, sort of the overwhelmingly overused uh, hospital spaces that, that are there right now. All right, that's um, number and two. And then the third is IFPR Brazil. Tell us about its its prototype. Yeah, so IFPR Brazil is a, uh, it uses the compressed air, the medical air from the wall that's available in, uh, in the ICU as well as oxygen. And it basically very silently combines them and produces the pressure waveforms delivering it to the patient. And it has a very simple intuitive interface with lots of feedback about what the uh, amount and uh, and the rate of the uh, um, the delivery is. Isn't so it's a, it's in many ways it's very similar to uh, according to the respiratory therapists and, and the ICU physicians that that judge these that that looks very similar to what you have in the ICU currently. So it was really impressive seeing that as a submission. Well, really, it is really, impressive really given that they've all taken such different approaches. 
but have all answered that question. I mean, if the ventilators are in scarce supply, the ventilators that keep the sickest patients alive, uh, and here they've come up with these innovative new designs to get more ventilators into hospitals around the world. What is going to happen with these three prototypes now? Yeah, the, it's very exciting, actually. So uh, starting next week, the manufacturing packages, so this is like a full uh, dossier that manufacturers would request that includes the design details, the components, material, and so on. Uh, the manufacturing packages would be available to qualified manufacturers. They can submit their interest. Uh, they complete a form on our website, and once we evaluate them, we can uh, share with them the manufacturing packages to begin the process of actually refining these for a final product and, and put it through regulatory testing. That's, I think, a really critical component in all this. Most, um, uh, most uh, countries right now have a expedited review process for approving these ventilators, so I think the sooner manufacturers jump in to do this, the, the better. Um, that's one leg. We're actually also trying to expedite this process and hit a specific cost target. So we're about to launch through McGill a second leg to this challenge, which is going to be called the Sub-K Challenge. The goal here is to uh, produce a ventilator that costs less than $1,000 a unit in order for the, these ventilators to be more widely accessible to people around the world. The goal for this second challenge is to take the three, one of the three designs in, the early, in, the, in, in our first challenge and to refine it further and bring the cost down to less than 1,000 Canadians. So I, we're I, very excited to I do have you, one more uh, concluding more. question, but what would, what would the price approximately of these three prototypes be? Uh, so for the, the, the first challenge, the first prize is 200000 the second is 100000 and the third is 50000 Sorry, what the, I, the I'm sorry, Dr. Farr, what I meant is if you're didn't getting it below 1000 what would it cost to manufacture the oh, three sorry. that you have yeah. right now? It would be a lot, substantially uh, more the, than that? The cost is uh, somewhat, right now, most of the material cost, which is the main thing that they've listed, is around, uh, typically around below 1000 uh, and we estimate that the manufacturing cost would probably come in at about 2000 or so. Okay, so you want to trim that down to, uh, to make make it even more available. That's really interesting. The uh, right. application widespread and immediate starting next week. Wrap it up for me. I'm wondering, you know, the surge, I mean, there is a concern in Quebec, as I was just talking about, but the surge in hospitals did not come as many had feared. But there was such a lot of attention on what this pandemic has revealed about Canada's stockpile, critical infrastructure and resources within the hospitals, and the question of were there, would there be enough ventilators for patients who might need it? What have we learned as a result of this, and you're right in the thick of it, uh, from this pandemic that we can apply and change as we look to the future? future? Uh, excellent question. I think, um, you know, and others have said this, that we prepare uh, extensively for defense issues, you know, war, situs, war scenarios, and we put a ton of money and a lot of uh, war games practice sessions to figure this out. Uh, in some ways, I'd say personally, I'm kind of shocked that every year we've had uh, model viruses, basically the cold virus, the seasonal flu virus, other viruses that we could have used to understand how these viruses spread and what we can do to alleviate the concerns from around them. Uh, and I think we know so little about it. And I think we need to treat uh, infection control and, and pandemic control, basically, on the same level as we do with uh, defense. Uh, one major issue, personally, I find, is that you know, uh, if 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 war breaks out, the first people, you know, all the soldiers get called basically uh, to 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 protect us. But in this case of the pandemic, the first thing that happened is all the every facility, including universities and research institutes, had to shut down. Um, it's it's almost completely counterintuitive uh, that we didn't have a process where we could actually grab a ton of researchers that have almost like soldier-like access, if you like, to research facilities to ramp up studying uh, ways of treating this. And I think that's, in my personal view, that's something we need to have in the future for preparation of pandemics. Well, with this challenge, you've brought a lot of great minds all around the world uh, to mull over new solutions to the needs that this has exposed. Thank you for telling us about the three finalist prototypes. We'll continue to watch as you uh, move into another phase of this challenge. Thanks again, Dr. Farivar, for your time today.